Today we meet Job. Perhaps for the first time, perhaps for the umpteenth time. Job from the land of Uz. Job, that character who seems to emerge more from the land of Oz, a context both surreal and all too real at the same time. For this story begins not in the realm we know, but in an undisclosed location, perhaps with a shiny yellow brick road where the heavenly beings are having a tete-a-tete, -a, -tete, a council meeting, an indaba. It is in this meeting, referenced in our text, read so well by Sherry this morning, where Job gets divinely profiled and targeted. In this most perplexing of narratives in our scriptures, Job is both protagonist and pawn. Pawn in the hands of a not only divine chess master god, but an opportunistic angel named Satan who, while seemingly sharing coffee with God, hatches a plan to test Job's faith through the unleashing of unimaginable suffering. After God brags Job's blameless uprightness and persistent integrity that always turns away from evil, the Satan, or better translated, the adversary, mockingly claims that such a stance toward God only comes from someone who knows no suffering. God disagrees and takes the bait, allowing the adversary to rain down suffering freely on Job the pawn in a nasty plan to prove that in the face of such pain, Job's faith will cave and praise will soon give way to cursing the very face of God. The adversary, with God's blessing, swoops down and takes from Job that which is most dear to him. First his livestock, then his livelihood, and then all of his ten children. Job goes from the model of success in business, family, and faith to the scourge of the earth in a moment. But instead of cursing, Job continues to praise. God gave, God takes away, blessed be the Holy One. But the adversary does not relent, and God continues to acquiesce and allows Job to be the guinea pig. Job's health is then taken from him. Disease riddles his body, and he sits alone in ashes with only a piece of pottery left to scrape his physical wounds while nothing is left to soothe his deeper emotional wounds. Despite the urging of his spouse, Job remains steadfast in his refusal to curse God, saying, Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? And at this place of absolute turmoil, Job's friends show up. And they show up at first as models of how we all should accompany those facing grief. They come with the humility of silence and the authenticity of their simple but profound presence. They join Job sitting in the ashes for seven days and seven nights, sitting Shiva with him, honoring his pain while keeping total silence in vigil with his grief. But then they open their mouths. In a section not included in today's reading, Elphiaz, Bildad, and Zophar begin speaking to Job from a place of theology. They plead with him to simply confess whatever sin he most certainly must have committed to incur divine judgment in hope of finding God's forgiveness and relenting of punishment. But over and over again, for several chapters in the book of Job, the maintenance of his innocence is put forth in defense, as he claims over and over again never to have sinned. Now we note here that not just the three friends, but also Job, clearly subscribe to a theology of retributive justice. What you give, you get. God blesses you with stuff if you're good and curses you with suffering if you're bad. Job's friends are convinced that he sinned since he is suffering. And even though Job remains unwavering in a denial of such a reality, he also buys into that bad theology and is confounded as to why God would punish him as he's done nothing wrong in his mind. This passage ends with Job wishing he could meet God in a court of appeals and give and, and bring God in to a trial to prove to God his innocence. But God doesn't show up. 
God is nowhere to be found. In an echoing of Psalm 22's, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Job can't find the divine. As scholars point out that the purpose of this quixotic book in the Hebrew scriptures is to offer a direct critique against the Deuteronomic orthodoxy embedded in part of the Torah's covenantal theology that promotes this reward and retribution theology as insufficient. On the one hand, I am deeply grateful for the book of Job, and I am guessing I'm not alone in needing to be reminded time and time over that the way of God is never the way of retribution or judgment. There is no health wealth gospel. If we're good and faithful people, it does not mean we won't encounter tough diagnoses. And if we see Job as a symbolic stand-in for the masses of oppressed and undervalued, underhoused, underheard people and creatures on this fragile earth racked with injustice, yet beloved of God, then I give thanks. For such a, such a Job never gives in to the doubting friends, nor backs down from what seems like a malicious, or at very least capricious, and often absent, God. However, on the other hand, I join in line with the ranks of liberational and queer theologians like today's Casey's Overton, who refuses to let this expression of God depict, depicted in Job off the hook. Casey writes, God is gone, Job suffers, and God has no response. The people of Israel were suffering exile, and God was silent. We are suffering, intersecting crises right now, and God is nowhere to be found. In Job's reeking flesh wounds, in the pain wrought tendons of overworked Hebrew exiles, and in the tiny caskets of COVID's most defenseless victims, where is the omnipresent, omnipotent, all-loving architect of the universe? Casey goes on to, to make the point that if Job is right here, and never indeed sins, then God naturally ends up being the problem character. For it is God who not only allows a subordinate angel to send suffering to Job in the first place, but to settle this cosmic and somewhat frivolous gamble destroys a huge set of oppressed and innocent people and animals linked to Job just to prove a point, just to save face. In Casey's words, isn't such deadly indifference tantamount to cruelty as, jo as Job's in innocent bystanders are massacred by stray bullets of this cosmic shootout. So in, in, in applying a socioeconomic power analysis to this text, we might look more closely at Job. We might see how the story goes out of its way to show how rich this individual from Uz is, with 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, and very many slaves. Clearly the, te the text says this. So such a pondering asks, could someone who owns such property, who even considers such fellow humans and animals as property in the first place, remain upstanding and without sin? Furthermore, at the end of Job, spoiler alert, God finally shows up in a form of power to put Job in his place. In short, God, the great creator of everything, says, how dare you, Job, even ask me a question. And in this bold declaration, Job is humbled and apologizes for wanting to put God on trial, and God restores all of, Job, Job, all of Job's fortunes double. Another analysis would ask if, is there a world in which the acquisition of more enslaved humans and thousands of animals could ever happen without the sins of exploitation and oppression. Especially after just experiencing a taste of what slavery's oppression might feel like, down to the scrape of the potsherd, Job once again goes back into those ways of exploiting others. So with such a lens, it is clear Job is flawed. And also with such a lens, we see that the God of Job is equally flawed. Neither can be let off the hook. But we see the unwavering determination of a suffering and a broken Job as holy. 
For we see the protest of the endangered, no matter how ethically tainted or ill-tempered, being always valid. Job persisted. Alleluia. Where there is suffering, where there is objection, where there is suffering and there is objection, Alleluia. Where there is injustice and there is protest, Alleluia. Where there is the absence of God and there is the interrogation of God, Alleluia. Thanks be to God. For such a holy protest demands that God does show up to a trial, that, ju- that, that God does come to a hearing and does not allow such theologies of inconsistency off the hook. As we look at our world now and know far too many people sitting in the ashes of injustice and suffering, we demand that God show up. For in the face of such injustice, in the face of our own complicity, the experience of Psalm 22's missing deity is all too common. My God, my God, why have you forsaken us? Why have you left us in this place? If I go forward, Job says, God is not there. If I go backward, I cannot perceive God. On the left, God hides and I cannot behold God. I turn to the right, but I cannot see God. So many people bring the question of theodicy to this text. Why does a good God allow evil to exist? And its close cousin, where is God in the face of suffering? Questions that remain very much unresolved, I might add, at the end of this book of Job, and perhaps, of course, linger with us at all times, especially when we or loved ones we know endure the fragility of existence. But I wonder if this text might be inviting us today, instead of posing, where is God in the face of suffering, to pose the question, where are we in the face of suffering? Where might we be, where might we be God for others in the face of pain and injustice? Where and when can we become the divine hands, feet, and heart of God for ourselves and for others who are hurting? It seems a whole portion of our world is swimming in 2021's continued disconcerting unprecedented unprecedentedness. I don't know if that's a word. For the first time in 414 years since Jamestown's ground zero when undocumented white settler colonialists first came across the waters to begin their occupation of Turtle Island, something unprecedented has happened. Today, this weekend, today and tomorrow, we live in a nation and a city that has officially recognized for the first time Indigenous Peoples Day as the second Monday in October. President Biden and Mayor Janey both having made formal proclamations to honor the legacy, living vitality, and tribal sovereignty of Indigenous people. A recognition that is long overdue, but one we celebrate. There are many events this weekend. I pray that you have been able to tune in to some of them in person or online to give thanks and to educate ourselves. But of course, federally, Columbus Day still is on the books. As I bring Rowan to school each weekday, I pass a fence really close to our house that has a large banner hanging, We Celebrate Columbus. A reminder here in our own watershed that the deep-seated white supremacy that still casts a looming shadow across this land is alive and well. So it feels timely, church, for us to join Boston and our nation in celebrating the sacredness embedded indigenous lives and legacy as we apply this Jobian interrogation. Where are we? Where are we as line three now flows through with dirty tar sand oil threatening the sovereignty and sacredness of the clean water of the Anishabe and Ojibwe people of northern Minnesota? Where are we in the still fully unexamined and reckoned with painful histories of residential schools for Native Americans, many of which in the 19th and 20th century motivated by Christianity held the policies of ethnocide and cultural genocide? linking to that quote, kill the Indian to save the soul. 
Unless we think these were just Catholic boarding schools, nine Presbyterian schools housed 38,000 children during those years, and three Congregationalist schools held some 14,000 children during those years. Where are we in the face of the ongoing crises of missing and murdered indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit? Where are we when we hear about the fossil fuel-driven man camps that emerge where pipelines are placed, connecting so much violence? Our nation was so tuned to the tragic story of Gabrielle Petito's death recently, which gripped the attention of our media and our landscape for days. Meanwhile, the cases of beloved BIPOC people go again and again untold for decades. Where are we in the local issues of Mattachusett, Mat Mat Massachusetts, Nitmuk, tribal sovereignty issues and continued attempts for federal recognition? Where are we regarding indigenous reparations and land back issues? Friends, I believe asking these hard questions about where, not about where is God, but where are we, can be first steps to tune our hearts and instruct our action. At the Enbridge headquarters occupation that took place a few months back, while many of us entered that company's deplorable, uh, that company's office with a deplorable ethic that has been behind both Line 3 and the Weymouth compressor stations, I met a softly spoken yet deeply committed activist, Craig Simpson. And after telling me he had just spent the previous three weeks out in Minnesota on his own dime at the Line 3 camps in solidarity with incredible water protectors like Tara Hauska, Craig began to tell me about two of his current missions. One is for churches like his own, Craig is Catholic, and for others, the Protestants among us, to begin de delving more fully into the truths and the complexities around residential schools. Not all those who worked in those schools were evil. Many moving from the compassionate stance uh, driven in our gospels, but too many, too many led to such a violence that is still under told. Craig has invited us to attend many vigils and advocacy events around this particular issue. He also told me about a second issue he is committed to, which is just about to unfurl uh, here in the Boston area, and I'm really excited about. Something he's calling back rent. We've heard about the, back, the land back in, uh, initiatives where people are giving their land back to indigenous communities. By the way, Craig Simpson freely gave away the home that he inherited from his grandmother on Cape Cod to the Mashapee Wampanoag tribe uh, earlier this year. But this back rent project is asking communities of faith who realistically cannot and will not give up their sanctuaries to indigenous tribal uh, uh, populations to give money back on a monthly basis. And I am going to invite our church to engage this process uh, truthfully and fully as he unfurls this project for downtown Boston churches. Craig walks the talk. Craig inspires me, I, insp I, I believe inspires us, as he asks that question over and over again, where can he be? It's a question that inspires the decolonizing of our histories and our memories. The history that uh, was told to us that John Kelly was the most famous of Boston runners. John Kelly indeed had a direct part in the naming of Heartbreak Hill as we lean into Monday's marathon on Indigenous Peoples Day. That hill right here in Newton, not far from where I am right now. But John Kelly is not the me, the center of that story. Ellison Brown is. The Indigenous runner who won the 1936 Boston Marathon of the Narragansett people. It was Ellison Brown who was being passed by John Kelly when John Kelly slapped him condescendingly on the back and Ellison Brown looked up and raced past John Kelly on Heartbreak Hill, leaving Kelly with a broken heart and won the 1936 marathon, went on to, the, to represent the United States at the German Olympics in 1936 alongside Jesse Owens. These stories I never learned until this very year. These are stories that change our perspective on how we see the world and how we see ourselves 
fitting into a more beautiful tapestry. I'm grateful that the Boston Marathon will lift up many of those voices after making the mistake of landing the marathon uh, unthinkingly on Indigenous Peoples Day. They are writing that wrong or doing their best to by telling many stories. If you listen on Monday to the broadcast, you will hear about many other uh, Indigenous runners and storytellers here in our area. Yesterday, as I was listening to the Celtic Colors International Celtic Music Festival, uh, I heard of the story linked to uh, the Irish potato famine in the 1840s. That devastating famine that took some one million people from the face of that landscape unjustly because of the lack of British involvement uh, and, and, and aid at the time was right around the time also of our own devastating trail of tears. President Andrew Jackson, one of the worst presidents in this country, uh, brought and forced the Choctaw Nation here to move. A trail of tears also killing thousands of people in the process. Dislocation. Just 17 years after that, the Choctaw people, after hearing about the Irish potato famine, sent $170 for Irish famine relief. You may have heard this story. In contrast, the U.S. government sent $50. This impoverished at the time nation, the Choctaw Nation, told the world that empathy matters, that reaching out beyond our prejudices matters. And they changed the narrative for me as I remember this and as uh, the Celtic sojourn and the Celtic festival has lifted these stories in new ways. It invites us to listen in new ways for a new way forward for a church, for a nation, and for individuals. So friends, when we encounter the injustices that will hit us and the loved ones we know, ask not where is God, but ask where are we? We will finish and we will continue now in the spirit of worship as we listen to a hymn and you're invited to sing or listen. It's a, a famous Dakota hymn. Many and great, O God, are thy things, maker of earth and sky. Thy hands have set the heavens with stars. Thy fingers spread the mountains and plains. Lo, at thy word, the waters were formed. Deep seas obey thy word. This hymn, written uh, and first published in 1842, is a tune of the Dakota, a traditional tune. And it was sung at a very tragic intersection in our history when there were when there was a great the, the the largest federally mandated execution in response to the Sioux uprising in the Dakotas this hymn was sung by the Dakota who were killed that day in 1862 December 26th 38 Dakota were executed by our government this song was sung and lifted up as a song of resilience, as a song of hope in the face of injustice. May we remember as we hear this song, may we lament, and may we recommit ourselves to God's fullness, to a correct theology that God is present in the midst of suffering, that God is leading us out of our haunted histories into a place of the kingdom of God, where equality, where justice, is realized and where God's presence is tangible and felt. Let us listen and let us pray. You're invited to sing or listen along. 